wherever you are, just join us in worship as we sing praises to the Lord who is yes. worthy of glory, Amen. honor, and praise tonight. Hallelujah. Amen. We give you the glory. Hallelujah. You are worthy to be praised from the rising Amen. of the sun Amen. to the setting of the same. The Lord's name is worthy to be glorified in spite of our situations and in spite of anything we may have gone through throughout this day. God, you are worthy to be magnified. Forget about oh, ourselves and we concentrate on him tonight. We give you the glory. Hallelujah. Come on. Wherever you are, if you could just clap your hands. I know you might be at home, but just come on and clap your hands. Let the spirit of the Lord fill your home tonight. Hallelujah. We give you the praise. enjoy what the man of God have for you this evening. Welcome one, welcome all.
Let's stand for prayer, please. Dear God in heaven, we pause at this time to recognize your sovereignty, to recognize your grace and your mercy that you continue to extend to us from morning until this time. We thank you for those who are attending in person and those who are doing so online. We pray a special prayer on each of these categories. We pray, God, that you will just endow us with your spirit as we worship you tonight. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. As we come together tonight, Father, we ask that you will do a special thing for us today. We pray that you will be with the man of God as he brings the word to us tonight. I pray, Father, that you would just allow your spirit to use him, hide him behind the cross, may self be put aside and only you be seen. We pray, God, that this will be a time together tonight where your word will go out as powerful as you would have it go so that men and women will be convinced and convicted of sin. And Father, at the end, we pray that you will bless us in a special way. And then we pray also for those who are on their way. We pray for traveling mercies. Protect them on the busy highways and on the streets. And Father, at the end of it, may we all feel the joy of knowing that we have been in your presence. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good evening, Kodo. It is such a pleasure to be here, especially on a wonderful, warm spring day like this. It was about 60 degrees, right? Or 60 something. Maybe you can put it up for me. Thank you. Um, the pleasure is mine to present tonight uh, what I entitled For Your Health. So we have embarked on this journey of sharing some health nuggets with you as we look at restoring hope. And tonight, I just want to talk to you a little bit about a few things. It's a little non-traditional way of talking about health, but we're going to talk about today. Well, let me just backtrack a little bit. Last week was National Public Health Week. And I want to take the time out to acknowledge all our public health practitioners that are members of CODA, but members of the wider community. A lot of times when we think about health, we think about the nurse and the doctor and maybe a physio or somebody else. But there's so many people that are part of the process to help you to attain the health status that you need. i just give you a little secret. Do you know that your airplane cannot lift or land without a public health practitioner? Search it up, you'll see. Your environmental health officer is an important person. You're, you go to the restaurant and you eat. You go to your supermarket. Who helps to make sure that your food is good? So shout out to all our public health practitioners. But I want to bring your attention to today. Today is April 7th and it's World Health Day. And it's, December, it's, it's observed every year on the 7th. It is there to raise awareness about global health issue, issues. It is there to highlight the importance of well-being. And of course, we celebrate this around the globe, coming together to promote a healthier world for everyone. The theme for 2024 is My Health, My Right. And we'll talk about that a little bit. But let's play a quick video from... <laughs> Her asthma, it's, it's getting worse. We can't help you here. We can't help you now. Come back next week. Can someone please tell me what's going on? You must pay cash to be admitted.
Now, it is a right. It is your right. So know your rights. We want to encourage you to understand that it is your right for safe and quality health care without any discrimination. It is your right for privacy and confidentiality your health info, for your health information. I know we talk about HIPAA, so if you can go and research that. Information about your treatment and to be informed about what you're being treated for and how you're being treated. It is your right for your bodily autonomy and integrity. And it is your right to make decisions about your own health. This is just an infographic that talks about your rights. Next. So tonight we want to encourage you to protect your right to health as a basic human right. Everyone should have access to health services that they need and when, when, they, when and where they need it without facing financial hardship. So if you cannot access health care, that's not a right. And here are some ways to take action. Organize. Organize your community, at church, at work. Agree at what is needed. See how you can help that, make that change. Advocate. Appeal to your political leaders. Join health communities. Demand action. Participate in petitions and discussion. And vote. Vote because health is a line item that you need to consider as you go forward in this election year. Promote the right to health as an intrinsic human right. Respecting our right to health means respecting our rights to access to safe drinking water, clean air, good nutrition, quality housing, decent working conditions, and freedom from violence and discrimination. But I want to stick a pin here because rights walk hand in hand with responsibilities. You should never or we should never be caught as the one doing against what we're asking to be right, to have a right about. Champion health as a priority. Get involved with decision making. Participate in your town halls, your citizen assemblies, focus groups, health councils, and minorities. We do not participate enough in clinical trials. Participate in clinical trials. I'll share the QR code. You can go on and search that. It will take you to the preamble of the Constitution of the World Health Organization. Can we just click that? We won't stay long on it, but the Constitution to the World Health. Thank you. If it will come up. If not, I encourage you to use the QR code and get some more information on what is, what is the World Health Organization putting forward to secure your right in healthcare. Next. And I close with this. Who has health has hope. Who has hope has everything. And 1 Samuel 26, 25 verse 6 tells us this. And I bid you all this. Long life to you. Good health to you and to your household. And good health to all that is yours. Thank you. It's now time for a theme song, everyone. I ask that you join me here and online as we lift up this song and Intro, we worship two, God some more. Three, four. Amen.
Well, good evening, everybody. Good, glad to see you all here this evening in our another installment of our Restoration of Hope Revival Series. I'm so grateful to see each and every one of you in the physical sanctuary and online. What a joy it is to have you worshiping with the Church of the Oranges, Seventh-day Adventist Church, where we are believing in God in hope for the future, hope for our families, hope for our lives, hope in Jesus. And we're grateful that we have the opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with you on this evening. If you're visiting with us in our virtual sanctuary, would you be so kind? We're, we're grateful you are our first time guest. Would you be so kind as to type hashtag new here in the chat? We also would like for you to like, subscribe, and share this YouTube channel with all of your friends, relatives, associates, neighbors, whoever you come in contact with. Please like, subscribe, and share. Also, you can do the same for our Instagram page, our Facebook page. We're always in the mood to connect with our wider community. And so if you do that, we'd be most grateful. Tonight, tonight, I want to... Um, I'll first say thank you to everybody who was participating tonight, but tonight, while they're giving me some more volume in the monitors, I, I want to, um, I want us to dig a little bit deep tonight. I'm going to challenge us tonight. Um, when we're studying God's Word, there are some passages of Scripture that are easier to understand than others. And the temptation is to default to the passages of Scripture that are easy to understand. But part of spiritual maturation is trusting the power of the Holy Spirit to talk to you through the text that are not as easy to understand so that you are growing in God's Word. You are moving from baby food to adult food. All of Scripture 
is good for inspiration and for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. And every book of the Bible has within it timeless truths that help the child of God to live in the righteousness of Christ on earth with the expectant hope of Jesus' return. So I want to call your attention. It was a scripture last night, one of the scriptures we used last night, but I want to go back there again, Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14, starting at verse 6. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking. Sometimes you've got to reach back to those old songs. When darkness seems to veil his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking. When he shall come with trumpets, oh, may I then in him be found clad in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand be for the throne on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is I know y'all are waiting for me to get to the sermon. I'm getting there. But every now and again, you got to reach back and grab some of those old hymns of the church. They, they are not our past. They are our link to our present and our future. And while we're embracing contemporary gospel and contemporary Christian, it's those hymns that were the foundation of our walk. That before we had what is termed gospel music fathered by Thomas Dorsey, we, we had the hymns. And those hymns helped to teach us theology. They helped to teach us doctrine, teaching. They helped to anchor our faith in the God we serve. So we need both. We, we, we need both. We need, we need both. 
We need both. So, so if you if you signed on to this YouTube this evening, you you you're gonna get both. You're gonna get both. Um, just put hashtag both in the chat. Um, the Lord be with you. Um, Revelation chapter 14. I promise. I'm gonna I'm I'm run on to see what the end's gonna be. Um, Revelation chapter 14, verse six starting at verse 6. Here is how it reads in the New King James Version of the Bible. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or in his hand. He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image. And whoever receives the mark of his name. Verse 12, conclusion. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Eternal Father in heaven, tonight we need your help to unpack Scripture as always. Clear our minds of what we think we know and make us receptive to what we need to know. And let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. You are our strength and our redeemer. Let everyone say together, Amen. The story is told about a woman named Debbie and her friends while they were flying at 12,000 feet above the ground. They were making preparations to jump out of an airplane. They dove out into the clear blue sky. These experienced divers planned to link in a mid-air formation. A few seconds into the free fall, Debbie went into a fast dive to catch up with the four others below her but she miscalculated her descent and slammed into another diver. The 25 kilometer, the 50 mile per hour impact knocked her unconscious and she bounced away. Debbie was plummeting toward earth with her parachute unopened and no way to open it. She flew past the instructor and jump master Gregory and he noticed the blood covering her face. Immediately, he forced his body into a dive, head tucked into his chest, toes pointed, arms flat at his side. He was now diving at 180 miles per hour. When he looked up to check, Debbie still seemed to be falling away from him, but he kept going as the horizon came up to meet him, trying to dive faster and faster. He maneuvered his shoulders ever so slightly to guide his descent toward the unconscious young woman. And then he was there beside her. He reached out and grabbed Debbie's reserve cord. Yanking it hard, he quickly moved away. Her chute opened, and she began drifting slowly toward the ground. At 700 meters, 2,000 feet, only 12 seconds from impact, Gregory opened his own parachute. The good news is Debbie and her rescuer 
both survived. I, I, I shared that story, set you up to ask a question. Do you feel like we are rushing headlong toward an impact with destiny? Does it feel like we're speeding toward a collision with the final events of Earth's history? We see the signs Jesus gave us being fulfilled. There are wars and rumors of wars. There are natural disasters, political division, and unrest in our communities. We see our society falling apart, divorce and abuse and human trafficking, and all kinds of evil are happening. Crime is on the rise, and the gospel is still going to all the world, impacting whole nations where it was once banned. All these things are rushing towards us. They are an indication that Jesus is soon to come. But even at this late hour, as bad as things look, would you help me celebrate tonight that God has planned a rescue? Yeah, yeah, yeah. God has a rescue plan in motion. He knows the human race is spinning rapidly toward its date with destiny. He knows the fate of millions will soon be decided forever. And God's rescue, as it is outlined in many other places in the Scripture, is also described in Revelation, the last book of the Bible. You see, God always, everybody say always, God always, always sends a message to prepare his people for major worldwide events which will affect their eternal destiny. There is a biblical pattern. God's message of warning is always sent before his judgment. And tonight, I want you to be aware that a loving God invites men, women, boys, and girls to be saved and not be victims of the calamity. Here it is. Here's an example. In Noah's day, God sent a message to prepare men and women for the coming destruction of the world by water. He longed for the people to be saved and not destroyed by the flood. God loved humanity so much, he allowed Noah to preach for 120 years, making loving appeals. A message of mercy, a message of warning always precedes major biblical events. It was only after the inhabitants of Noah's day rejected the message of mercy that God sent the flood. This pattern was repeated again and again in the Old Testament. God sent his prophets to warn Israel before the impending doom. In the New Testament, God sent John the Baptist to prepare the way for the first coming of Jesus. And all through history, God has sent a message to prepare his people for great world-shaking events. And once again today, God has a special message to prepare us for the soon coming, the second coming of Jesus Christ. The message of God to prepare us for the second coming of Jesus is something that is for us and our children in these last days. God has given us a message that is important for us to understand. There is an urgent message. Let the church say urgent. There is an urgent message in the book of Revelation which has eternal significance for our world tonight. And let me just give you some historical matter on the book of Revelation. A lot of times people hear the book of Revelation and they are intimidated by the signs and the symbols. They are intimidated by the beast and the, and the seals and the, and the, 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 the candlesticks. There, there, there's so much imagery in the book of Revelation, and people are intimidated. Can I tell you what the book of Revelation is all about? It, the book of Revelation is about people who are looking for hope in the last days before the coming of Christ. That's all it is. The context of Revelation, the ones, the, 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 the audience that John wrote the book of Revelation to, they were just trying to live the best way they could in difficult times as they prepared for the coming of Christ. 
That's it. And tonight, I don't want us to be scared of Revelation. I want us to embrace Revelation. Tonight, Revelation chapter 14 says to us, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. That, 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 to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, God's last day message is an urgent message. It goes swiftly, quickly to the ends of the earth. It's a universal message. I told you last night, and I told you at the start of our series, that the gospel, that what, what the truths in Scripture are not just for one culture. They're not just for one group of people. They are for everybody. And Revelation chapter 14 houses for us a very significant message. In Revelation 14, verses 14 through 16, the Bible says, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap. For the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he sat, he who sat on the cloud thrust his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Now, now we heard this word harvest in this text. We read the three angels' message from Revelation 14, 6 through 12. Then we get to uh, verse 14 through 16, and we hear this word harvest. What is the meaning of Revelation's symbol of harvest? What does it mean when we see the word harvest? Matthew chapter 13, 39 gives us a good indication. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. I hope you're with me tonight. Revelation describes the second coming of Jesus with the symbol of Jesus coming to reap earth's final harvest. And the message of the three angels prepares men and women living in earth's last hour for the return of our Lord. And do I have anybody in the virtual sanctuary and in the physical sanctuary who is excited about the second coming of Jesus? You just can't wait for him to burst the clouds. You can't wait for this troubled world to be over, for time to be no more, for the hourglass of prophecy to tilt over and be emptied out. You're ready for him to crack the sky. You're ready to see. You're ready for the appearance of the cloud, the size of the man's hand, like the, like the old preachers used to say. You're ready to see the wings of the white horse coming through the clouds and Jesus sitting on it, coming back home. You're ready to sing that song right now while you're listening to me. Lift up the trumpet. And loud let it ring. Jesus is coming again. Cheer up, ye pilgrims. Be joyful and sing. Jesus is coming again. I'm so glad to know that tonight we have hope that Jesus will come again. A new day will dawn. Christ will return. There will be, the heavens will be illuminated with the glory of God. The reign of sin will come to an end. Christ will come to take his people home. But before he returns, he sends us a very important message. And here it is, back to Revelation 14, 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. The message that's being talked about here is the everlasting gospel. Now, that word gospel is really all it means is good news. The everlasting gospel, the everlasting gospel is, 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 is good news that does not end. Okay, y'all didn't care, okay. Yeah, everlasting is something that doesn't end. Gospel is good news. So the everlasting gospel is good news that does not end. And the good news that through Jesus our hearts can be changed, our vision can be clear, our guilt can be gone. The everlasting gospel is also the good news that the grip of sin on our lives can be broken. Through Jesus, we can be set free. Because whom the Son sets free is free indeed. 
The Apostle Paul describes this gospel in 1 Corinthians 15 when he says, for I, verses 3 and 4, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to scriptures. Ladies and gentlemen, the everlasting gospel helps us first to understand that Christ died for our sins. The gospel, the gospel, somebody say the gospel, write it in the chat, the gospel, the gospel centers on the death of Christ. Our hope is anchored in the cross of Christ. I want you to catch this. And our faith depends on what Christ did for us, not what we do for ourselves. Through the cross, Salvation, forgiveness, mercy, and grace are ours. There, there was no other way to save the human race. And in one of the most familiar texts of Scripture, Jesus declares, John 3, 16, y'all know it, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The centerpiece of the Bible is Jesus. But what about Jesus? What's so, what's so great about Jesus? I'm glad you asked. Jesus is not only the centerpiece of the Bible, but when we look at the life of Christ, Christ lived a perfect life. Yeah, Christ lived a perfect life. Christ's perfect life record is put in place of the sinful records of all those who accept him. Yeah. He was perfect. We are imperfect. Through his perfect righteousness, we stand complete in him. Have you ever thought about this that um, Jesus loves us so much that he throws our foolishness, our sins, our dirt, he throws it into the depths of the sea not to be remembered anymore. Okay, y'all need an illustration? Y'all a little slow tonight? Okay, here we go. So, um, when I was growing up, grade school, you know, grade school, at the end of this day, back then we didn't have smart boards or flat screen TVs or iPads, none of that stuff. We have none of that stuff. We had, we had hard wooden chairs, we had those steel and wooden desks, and we learned from the chalkboard, the blackboard. Well, there was a routine that we had to undergo every single day at the end of the day. At the end of the day, two students were chosen, one to erase the blackboard, and then another one to come with a bucket of water and a soapy sponge and take the sponge and go over the, what was just erased from the blackboard. The purpose of the student who erased the blackboard was simply to get the chalk off the board enough so that the student with the sponge and the soap and water could come and get rid of completely what the other student started. So that the two students who cleaned the blackboard the day before, when the students came in the next morning, they didn't see what was there yesterday. Come here, that's what Jesus does with our sins. What he does is he erases our sins so that when people look at you, they don't see the mess that was on the board yesterday. They see a new you complete in him. That's, 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 that's the amazing thing about Jesus. He lived a perfect life. He, we are complete in him. The other great thing about Jesus, and I hope y'all feel this the way I feel this, is that Christ rose from the dead. He rose from the dead. He not only died for us, he not only rose for us, but thanks be to God, he lives for us. We can come to him with all of our weakness and our sins. We can bring everything that troubles us. And then not only did Jesus die, not only did Jesus rise, Jesus ascended to the Father. 
He is alive today, seated at the right hand of God, where he ever lives to make intercession. He ascended to the Father thousands of years ago and is before his throne. He knows your name. He understands your needs. He's longing and waiting to hear your prayers. And his desire, his greatest desire, child of God, is to save us in his kingdom. So tonight, while we're searching for hope, we also need to have peace with our hope. We, we, we need to ask ourselves some questions tonight. How can I be free from guilt? How can bad habits be changed? How can sin be overcome? The answer is in the everlasting gospel. Here it is. It's not that deep. You don't have to go to seminary. You don't need the demon, a PhD, a THD. You don't have to know anything about soteriology, eschatology, pneumatology. You don't have to know none of that to understand this. Here it is. How can your life be changed? Here it is. Jesus is the answer. That's, that's it. That's all I got. I told you it wasn't that deep. It wasn't that deep. Jesus forgives. Jesus changes lives. His grace and power is available to us all. However, before Jesus can come back, long neglected truths need to be restored. Revelation's urgent message is pictured by these three angels flying in mid-heaven, and there is an urgent call to do three things. The first call is a call to obedience. Let the church say obedience. Boy, that's a cuss word in some places today. Boy, people don't want to hear a word obedience. It sounds too much like dominance. It sounds too much like master-slave. People don't want to hear the word obedience. People don't obey the laws of the land. They don't obey the laws at home. They don't obey. God knows they don't obey laws in church. There is an oversaturation of free grace without paying attention to the importance of the law. <laughs> ah, I'm enjoying myself right now. There, there is an oversaturation of grace, 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 grace without law. The law, somebody say the law. The law is a transcript of God's moral character. Grace is what God gives to us when we make mistakes in life with the law. Here's the truth. You ready for this? Why grace is so powerful? Because you and I don't have enough consciousness to keep the law on our own. You won't do it. Left to your own, you won't keep the law. You won't obey the commandments. You won't walk in step with God's moral blueprint for righteousness. No, 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 no. But so when we misstep, when we fall out of line, God says, okay, I see what happened with the law. Here's your grace. But the grace is not a get-out-of-jail-free card. I know somebody is saying, wait a minute, preacher, grace covers. Yes, it's not a get out of jail free card. Grace is what God gives you so that you'll listen to the Holy Spirit on your heart and not repeat the bad habit you just did. Uh, so we be grace and law. Not either or, both and. Revelation 7 says, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Listen, the Bible says we are to fear God. Now that word fear, don't fear the word fear. I know that there's a saying that says we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Don't fear the word fear because when we talk about fearing God, we're not talking about being afraid of God. We're talking about respecting or reverencing God. 
Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 says, Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Can I put the definition in that text? Reverence or respect God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Proverbs 3, verse 1 says, My son, forget not my law, but let your heart keep my commandments. God is calling us back to obedience to his law. He's calling us to keep his commandments. Revelation 14 describes God's end time people this way in Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Revelation 14, 7. 14, 6, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. God's message is a call first to fear or obey God. Secondly, it's a call to give glory to God. Now, what does it mean to give glory to God? Real simple answer. You ready for this? Are y'all writing or putting this stuff in your notes? Y'all doing that at home? I, you, need to, you need to do this. Giving glory to God is honoring God with our lifestyle. All right. I mean no disrespect to anybody's culture of church. I mean no disrespect. Giving glory to God is not just about how loud you shout in a church setting. Giving glory to God is seen clearest with how you live for him once you leave out of here and are not shouting anymore. Ugh. Giving glory to God is how we honor him with the way we conduct our life. And in this book of Revelation, God is calling us to understand the need to honor him in all areas, including how we treat our bodies. This includes what we eat, drink, and how we live. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. In other words, Paul is saying, whatever you're doing, do it and honor God with your life. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Our bodies are not playgrounds. They're not bounce houses. They're not littering parks. Our bodies are the temples of the living God. He also appeals to us to give him glory and honor in every aspect of our lives, and Revelation continues this urgent message, fear God and give glory to him and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Who is this message calling us to worship? The creator of heaven and earth. The very basis, I want you to catch this in your notes tonight, the very basis of worship, loyalty to God, devotion to God, adoration to God, the very basis of worship is the fact that God created us. The worship is not based on what he's done for you first. It's based on who he is first. <sighs> you making me work tonight. Revelation 4.11, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. The final conflict, that, that phrase, great controversy that you're hearing all the time, the final conflict between good and evil focuses on the issue of worship, specifically who we worship, whether we worship the creator or the beast. I'm getting a little heavier now. I'm circling, I'm circling, I'm circling the track. I'm going a little bit further. Revelation chapter 14 is calling us back to accepting God's sign of loyalty instead of the mark of the beast. The, the, the beast mark. Worship God. We're called to worship 
the creator. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. Revelation's message does not say the hour of God's judgment will come. It says the hour of God's judgment has come. And could it be that we are living in the judgment hour? Could it be that the destinies of all humanity are soon to be settled by the choices we are now making. Before the coming of Jesus, heaven's final judgment will determine who will receive what, what reward when he comes. Now, i got to explain that word judgment for you because I don't want you to be confused by the book Revelation. I told you that when we started. All the word judgment means is evaluation. That's all it means. And... There is judgment to be excited about. <laughs> ah, y'all, y'all ain't coming back on Friday. Ah, there's judgment to be excited about. And then there's judgment to be concerned about. Ah, when Jesus comes, every one of us will receive our just reward. So this, this text is talking to us about eternal choices. Revelation 22 verse 12, and behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. If Jesus is coming to give out his rewards, there must be a judgment and evaluation preceding his return to determine who gets what reward when he comes. Revelation 16, 7, even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Listen, listen to me very carefully. I want us to be clear. God will not make a mistake when it comes to our evaluation. (laughs) There will not be an oops. There will not be a clerical error. There will not be a mishandling of your life's account. That's why we are called to honor God with our lives now so that there'll be no mistake then. Are y'all hearing me? So that, and I don't know about you, but this is just me, I'm trusting God Pour his righteousness into me now so I can live for him daily. And I don't care if I'm the last person in. As long as my feet are on the inside. Oh, man. Yeah, y'all ain't. And I don't need, listen, I, I'm trying to tell y'all, so, see, listen, some of y'all here, no, I'm going to live, I'm going to do what I can now. I only live once. I'm going to just do it. I'm going to do me. I'm going to do, do whatever I got to do. Listen, go ahead and do that. But as for me, I need my feet on the streets of gold, not in the lake of fire. Okay, I just wanted, I just wanted to say that real quick. I just... I don't don't really like hot summers. I don't really like hot summers. So you don't like heat. I mean, we're considering a different different style of life. Um, Listen, there's not going to be a mistake when Jesus comes back. I know, I know we read on the news where, where, where earthly courts make mistakes and people go to prison for crimes they didn't commit and are sentenced unnecessarily and unjustly. I know judges make mistakes. They get things wrong in sentencing. I know that juries make mistakes. They don't examine the evidence the greatest. But God never makes a mistake. His judgments are true and righteous. Revelation reveals that every human being alive when Jesus comes who have already made their final decision for or against Christ. Revelation 22, verse 11. Y'all enjoying the Bible? All right, I don't know how to do it any other way. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. 
He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And the, tonight, listen to me, the Christ of Revelation is appealing to you and I. He wants you to be saved. He wants you to live in his kingdom forever. Jesus cannot bear the thought of anyone being lost. And more than anything else, he desires to be with you forever. So he sent an urgent message for you and I. Here it is again in summary. The message of the first angel. Let everybody say the first angel. The message of the first angel is a call to accept the everlasting gospel. It's a call to loving obedience. It's a call to give glory to God in every area of our lives. It's a call to worship the creator. It's a call to live godly lives in the light of earth's final judgment. God's final appeal is an appeal for loyalty, an appeal for commitment, an appeal for obedience. This urgent message in Revelation 14 reveals truth and exposes error. And the Bible says that many will not follow the word of God and will be led away from God. They will follow the teachings of man. Here's what God's word wants us to understand further in Revelation 14. And another angel followed saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. For she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. That word Babylon, I told you, don't be scared of the book of Revelation. I'm going to I'm going to give you these meanings as we go along. Babylon is confusion or mixture. Babylon finds its origins back in Genesis chapter 11 thereabouts, where it is believed by theologians and historians alike that one of the individuals who was leading out in the project of the Towers of Babel was Babel. A man named Nimrod, who was one of the leading project managers looking to build the towers that would extend beyond the heavens. And as they were building the towers, y'all know Genesis chapter 11, as they were building the towers, God looked down and said, let us, I don't have time to unpack the Trinity in that moment, let us go down. And confuse their languages. Ah, because their project, listen very carefully, was leading people away from God's intent for their life. Watch this. Coming out of the ark, the repopulation of the earth, it was never in God's intent for his people to settle. It was his desire for them to scatter. Because he needed the grace of God shared across the then no world. But they settled because they wanted to build something that was greater than the one who created them. And when you want to do something greater than God, you have made your decision who you worship. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. And today, and today, and today, and I, again, I mean no disrespect. I just, I'm just trying to preach it the way the Lord gave it to me. We live in a world of false doctrines. All kinds of things that aren't in Scripture are being toted as the truth. And they lead people away from God's Word. Even in the church. False doctrines would arise. We generally refer to this system as Babylon. God is calling his people today back to come, to come back to his word, to come back to the Bible that is the foundation of, of the Christian faith. The Bible is for us our light and our guide. Are you hearing me today? For the Christian faith, the Bible is light 
on our God. I like to refer to the Bible as the basic instructions before leaving earth. You write that out when you get home. You'll get, you'll, get the, you'll get the acronym. Basic instructions before leaving earth. Listen to what Jesus said in John 17, 17. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Revelation leads God's people back to his truth, and God wants each of us back to his word today. And there are so many people who are concerned about, about, about the mark of the beast. So let me, let me, let me, let me, let me drop that on you with clarity and, qui and, and quickness. The, the central issue regarding the mark of the beast is worship. And quiet as it's kept... It's not the QR code on a cereal box. It's not the COVID vaccine. Listen to the text. This is why you can't interpret from silence. Listen to the text. The text talks about receiving the mark in the forehead or in the hand. This is symbolic of having the mindset and living out the activity. It's about having the mindset to live opposite of the will of God. It is having the mindset and living the lifestyle that says, I know better than God. Because if you didn't choose God, you've chosen. Okay, y'all got it. It's, 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 it's not what can be seen in your hand. It's what's seen through your life that is the result of what you're acting out that you thought in your mind. That's why we have to be careful. I don't have time tonight. That's why we've got to be careful what we take in. Because if you take in the wrong stuff and you don't have the strength to filter it out, you don't have what they used to say when I passed in Louisiana. You're not, you're, not, you're not smart enough to eat the watermelon and spit out the seeds. You're going to fool around and choke on the seeds. And a lot of us are choking on false teachings. Things that aren't in Scripture, and God's Word is calling us back to honor God's word, to honor him with our lives so that we will be sanctified by his word. Oh, man, I don't have time. Revelation 14, 6 and 7, I'm going to do this again. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. This, again, is a call to worship the creator of heaven and earth. It's a call to true worship. Let the church say true worship. The issue is over worship. Revelation 14, 9 says, Then a third angel, somebody say a third angel. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or in his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. The angel's warning against receiving the mark of the beast is one of the most serious in the entire Bible. And the Bible is teaching us clearly who will be faithful at the end time. Here it is again, Revelation 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And where is that found? In the Bible. Let's summarize. I'm getting ready to go. Come on, Pharrell. Let's play Are You Ready for Jesus to Come? Revelation 14, 7 is a call to true worship, worshiping the Creator. Revelation 14, verse 9 is a warning against false worship. Revelation 14, 12 presents the true followers of God. The issue is worship. God will have a group of people who will worship Him as Creator and Lord by keeping all of His commandments. God's last day message warns us 
against the devil's deception in the last days. It's an appeal to surrender completely to God and commit our lives to following truth. What does God want for his people? A heart loyal to him. Willing obedience. I want to ask you tonight, have you come to a place in your spiritual life where you have said, Lord, I give all my life to you. All that I have and all that I am is yours. I want to close with a story of a young boy who experienced a tragic accident. He was near death. His inner organs were seriously damaged. The doctors needed to perform a delicate surgery. After the surgery was going on for a while, the boy lay in the recovery room in a weakened condition, and the doctors ordered a blood transfusion. They searched for a donor with the same blood type, and the boy's father responded. In those days where this story originated, hospitals used direct blood transfusions. Blood flowed directly from the donor's arm to the patient. The nurse pricked the father's arm with a needle. The blood began to flow through the plastic tube directly into the boy's weakened body. And as the father looked at his son with tears in his eyes, he turned to the doctor and said, Doctor, if you need to, take it all. C come a little bit closer. On a cross called Calvary one Friday on a hill called Golgotha, Jesus said, Father... Take it all. Take every drop of my blood. And the Jesus who gave all invites you and I to give him our all. The Christ who hung on the cross invites us to die with him. Die to our selfish ambitions. Die to our pride. Die to our lust. Die to our habits to give him our all totally and completely. What is your desire tonight? Will you give him your all? Tonight, will you make a commitment to worship one true and living God, the creator of heaven and earth? One who put a rescue plan in place for you and I, knowing that he had to give us a lot of chances to be a part of the rescue plan. Tonight, I want you to know, listen to me, for the person who's been searching for something more than what you've been experiencing. Not only is Jesus the answer for the world today, but there is no reason for anyone to be lost. The choice is ours. What will you do? Who will you serve? May I recommend to you tonight that you try Jesus. He has never, ever failed. Jesus is coming soon. Sooner than we think. Jesus is coming for faithful children. And I want tonight to be very clear and I, again, I'm not saying this flippantly. I'm saying this very honestly. I mean no disrespect. When Jesus was headed towards Calvary, his final moments before he was led to that week where he would endure dehumanizing agony, he told the disciples, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. 
In my Father's house were many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He said he's coming again. When he ascended to the Father, they were standing there gazing, and two men in white appeared and said, Why stand you gazing? This same Jesus, who was taken for you in like manner, will also come again. And we don't know when he's coming. We just know that he's coming. So because we don't have a date or a day, we just have to be ready. So whenever he comes, we won't be caught slipping. Tonight, that's my simple appeal. Will you honor God with your life so that when he's ready to evaluate, you can hear those words, well done, a good and faithful servant. I'm telling you, that's, that's what I'm living to hear. I'm living to hear from his lips, well done, thou good and faithful servant. If your desire is to honor God with your life, to choose Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, wherever you may be, if you're in the physical sanctuary, lift your hand where you are, somebody will see it, you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, perhaps you're here and you've never been baptized, you want to be baptized, you want to experience Going down to the water, symbolizing being buried, the old life being buried, and being brought up into newness of life, symbolic of resurrection with Jesus Christ. You're here or you're in the virtual space. If you're in the virtual space, would you just put in the chat, hashtag I choose Jesus. Hashtag I choose Jesus. If you're in the physical sanctuary, lift your hand where you are. I'm getting ready to pray with you. The, we're having baptism during our Sabbath worship experience this Saturday. We come together to worship and celebrate God, and one of the many ways we enjoy what God is doing in the lives of people is that we are witnesses and celebrators of people who give their lives to Christ through baptism. We'd love for you to be here. We'd love for you to be a part if that's your desire. I'm going to pray for you. But as you are contemplating, as you are reflecting, as you are meditating on the Word, may I just remind you, Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other, Jesus is the way, Jesus is the answer for the world today, above him there's no other, Jesus is so, Jesus, tonight we have heard about the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ, the desire to save us, the desire to give us a new life and a new walk. In these days and times that we're living in, oh God, we beg for your spirit to lead, guide, and direct us. And tonight, we're being called to make a decision. Who will we worship? God, I pray that the choice is made through the power of your Holy Spirit, that everyone under the sound of my voice will choose Jesus, will choose to worship the one who created the heavens and the earth. God, tonight, my prayer 
is that by your grace, we will be saved and not lost. Go with us this week. And God, there are going to be moments that challenge our ability or our desire to give glory to you. God, we pray that you would help us to choose to honor you with our life. Not because we want to be seen, but we want people to see what happens when we allow the Lord into our lives. And the outflow is a witness of the transforming power of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Listen, we thank you for sharing with us tonight. We're so excited about the rest of our Restoring Hope series. We're going to be together on Friday, 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 April 12th at 7 p.m. here in the sanctuary at 270 Reynolds Terrace. The city of Orange, we want you to come. We want you to bring your friends, your relatives, your associates, your neighbors. We want you to like, subscribe, and share. We want you to tell people about Jesus Christ and his love. Tell somebody that Jesus loves them unequivocally. Jesus loves them without limits. Tell somebody that Jesus is the answer to the need to have your hope restored. Until we see each other again, may God bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and forever. Let everybody say amen. Amen. See you on Friday night.